Once again, everyone, good afternoon. Thank you to all of you for coming to this significant and very unique dedication ceremony presented by the National Museum of the United States Air Force in honoring the exhibit that captures a Medal of Honor mission in Southeast Asia that occurred on the 26th of November, 1968. Many of you in this audience, I know, were, were there in Southeast Asia on that day, and some of you participated in this very mission. It is a mission of one helicopter of the 20th Special Operations Squadron that flew in under tremendous fire, being covered by one gunship to extract a seven-man team from very dangerous situations there in Cambodia. That team was Reconnaissance Team Chisel of MACV SOG, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, Special Operations Group, Command and Control South. I'm sure everyone here has seen this amazing, beautiful exhibit which captures the moment that the team boarded the aircraft and everyone was flown out to safety. A very unique exhibit and I'm sure one that is uniquely significant and probably one of the very few within the Department of Defense museum collection that captures a singular Medal of Honor mission. At this time, I invite you to stand as the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Color Guard team posts the colors, and please remain standing following for the playing of the national anthem.
Thank you. Please be seated. Many of you in the audience already know this, but in our presence today, we have a total of four, actually more than four, veterans of various units that directly, directly participated in this singular action on the 26th of November, 1968. We have veterans represented from the 20th SOS. We have veterans represented from the reconnaissance team on the ground of MACV SOG. And we have representatives who were also the guys flying up above, the FACs, the Ford Air Controllers. So I would like to invite to the stage one such veteran. This gentleman, many of you know, this gentleman is Fred Cook, who was actually on the Medal of Honor aircraft that day on the right door, at the right door gun. And at that time, he was then Staff Sergeant Fred Cook. So at this time, I invite Fred Cook to give us our invocation. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much this wonderful day. We thank you for what this day stands for. Lord, we thank you for the safety of those that are here this day and for the mission that we flew back in November 26. Lord, we wonder sometimes why we are the ones that made it back. But Lord, that's not in our plan to know. You have the master plan. You have the master battle plan. We don't know the short sortie that we're on. Lord, as he continued to bless this assembly, Bless each one here. Bless the ones that are moving in as we move out. And just let everything be done in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you, Fred. With us we have a wide panel of distinguished visitors and guests, and I would like to recognize them at this time. First and foremost, we'd like to recognize the director of this, this hallowed ground, this amazing, amazing museum that is one of a kind in the world. The director of the National Museum of the United States Air Force, United States Air Force Lieutenant General, retired Jack Hudson. Thank you, John. The beauty about this ceremony is that we have veterans of the past, but we also have veterans of the current day that demonstrate and represent the lineage of these wonderful units. And we have several active duty individuals with us today. I would like to recognize initially the Vice Commander of the 27th Special Operations Wing, Cannon Air Force Base, Air Force Colonel Michael Conley. Thank you, Colonel. We're also proud to have with us today the commanding officer of the current 20th Special Operations Squadron at Cannon with us today, Lieutenant Colonel Jeremy Bergen. Thank you, sir. There's a lot of history in these buildings, and there are a lot of historians that ensure that the facts and the things that you see before you are accurate and correct. In charge of the historians here at the National Museum of the United States Air Force, we have historian Dr. Jeffrey Underwood. And now we recognize a few veterans who were there in Southeast Asia. This gentleman, folks, is particularly special because none of us would be here today if it were not for one individual. This gentleman has put forth so many hours and so many dollars to ensure that a lot of this comes together and that we could all gather here today to recognize this amazing exhibit. I'd like to honor United States Air Force Senior Master Sergeant Retired, Jim Burns. I'm, I'm proud to call you my friend. Thank you, Jim. Jim is a two-tour Southeast Asia vet, and he flew, I think, every manner of helicopter in Southeast Asia. So, yes. Next, as we introduced you before, one of the individuals aboard Lieutenant Jim Fleming's helicopter manning the right door gun and the crew chief of the Medal of Honor aircraft, Fred Cook. Yes. Yeah. 
Fred is a retired Air Force Senior Master Sergeant. Thank you for your service, Fred. Now, you have one man on the right door, but there is also another. And on the left door, manning the left gun on the Medal of Honor aircraft. Today, we are so privileged to have J.J. Jensen. J.J. Who would have thought two guys from the Medal of Honor aircraft at this event? We're not done. We have a representative of the reconnaissance team that was actually on the ground. One individual out of three Americans on reconnaissance team Chisel, Mac V. Saw, Command and Control South. We are terrifically honored to have, us, have with us today Mr. Randy Harrison. We're not done yet. So we have veterans of the helicopter. We have a veteran of the reconnaissance team. But there's one more group that enabled that rescue to happen. And that was the individual flying overhead in an Oscar Deuce, an O2, the fact driver, overseeing this entire operation. We have with us today Air Force Lieutenant Colonel retired Bill Huber. And there's Bill in the back. We also have in the crowd veterans of those various units. So at this time, if you served in Southeast Asia and you're a veteran of Mac V. Sog, would you please stand so that we could recognize you? Mac V. Sog veterans. Amazing, amazing men. Likewise, if you served in the United States Air Force Special Operations Squadrons in Southeast Asia, would you please stand so we can recognize you? And finally, the gentleman who orchestrated so many of these missions, if you served as a Ford Air Controller in Southeast Asia, could you please stand so that we may recognize you as well? I'd like to recognize briefly two individuals who could not be present with us today. One is still living and the other has passed. The two individuals who were also part of this singular mission the gunship driver that provided cover for Lieutenant Fleming's aircraft was at that time Major Leonard Gonzalez. Major Gonzalez at the time still alive and lives in California, but because of the valor of Lieutenant Gonzalez, correction, Major Gonzalez and his crew, Lieutenant Fleming and his aircraft were able to, to execute their mission. So I'd like to recognize Major Leonard Gonzalez, who I should add, because of his valor that day, was awarded the Air Force Cross. So if we could give a round of applause to Major, or Major Gonzalez. Finally, the individual who cannot be with us today because they have passed was the team leader of reconnaissance team Chisel. And at that time, that was the United States Army Staff Sergeant Ansel Sonny Franks. But those of you in, in SOG know the term 1-0. And from what I've heard from the individuals who served with Sonny Franks, the one zero, the leader, everyone has nothing but the highest respect and homage to Sonny Franks. Sadly, Army retired Master Sergeant Sonny Franks passed away in 2004. But I think because of the valor and the training and the discipline of Sonny Franks, maybe more Americans would not be here today. So I'd like to recognize Sonny Franks as well. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to introduce our panel of ceremony speakers. And the first speaker we'd like to invite to the podium is the historian of the Na National Museum of the United States Air Force. We'd like to recognize and invite Dr. Jeffrey Underwood. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. 
On behalf of General Hudson, the museum staff, the museum volunteers, and our visitors, welcome home to the National Museum of the Air Force. We would also like to take a moment not only to remember the past, but our present. And thank you for being here. This has been a really sweet spot in time for me today to watch the continuity of basically 50 years in full circle, much like a propeller or a rotor on a helicopter. So this is a, this is a wonderful day for us. But this is what we do. We bring the past into the present. That is our purpose. We make sense of what you men and women have done for our Air Force and for our Republic. And that's our job, is to make sure that people do not forget. We are the keeper of your stories, and we hope we do it right. So for that reason, telling the story of the secret war in Southeast Asia was really important to this National Museum. A lot of us know about the secret war. During the time, I was still pretty young. I knew nothing of it. Most Americans knew nothing of this war. We were not told because it was a secret war. And that's why now that we can tell your stories, it is so important for us to do so and do so well. The clandestine efforts that were conducted during that war to try to stop the flow of men and supplies from North Vietnam never got the recognition at the time unless it was leaked by the press, of course. We, I think most of you all know that that did happen a couple of times. But the American people are still kind of fuzzy on the whole thing of the Southeast Asia war. We know what our current special operations people do. We, we got to see a lot of video from Desert Storm. And so we have a pretty good idea. We don't we will never know exactly, but we can try to understand. And what we certainly do not know is how dangerous each and every one of these missions were. No matter how routine it may have seemed at the beginning, it could always go south, as you all well know. So now we get the opportunity to tell these once classified stories in your National Museum, the United States Air Force. Now, here in the Southeast Asia Gallery, Southeast Asia War Gallery, what we're trying to explain is how this war was conducted across the border, jumping the fence into Laos and Cambodia. And the diorama is designed to match with the broader story of the secret war because the, the broader story is one thing, but we were trying to capture one instance, one snapshot in time of a moment that should not be forgotten. And that's what this is all about, is one little snapshot of time. And that snapshot includes not just an aircraft. The aircraft is important, but the people are much more so. And that's what we're trying to get across to everyone who walks through. They may not know about the secret war. They may not know about the war in Southeast Asia. They may not know a great deal about it, except for what they've seen in movies. So if we have done this well, and I think we've done a pretty good job, a person will walk up and they will see that diorama and they will be drawn in and they will learn more about what you men accomplished and what you did for us, for each of us. So this little instance is just one of those little moments that as you walk through this museum, you'll see that this little second in time, a moment in time, is not a great deal different than if you go back into the World War I section or you go into the most current operations. You will see these little moments of time, and this is what provides a continuity throughout this entire museum that will tie not only you, but you and also the children who are walking through this door, and perhaps they too will follow this lead. So we have a 50-year circle, and I hope the 50 next 50 years continues to fill out this circle and make it a brighter one for people to understand and have a greater appreciation for what has been accomplished and what was sacrificed and give hope for our future, which is bright. So as one last thought, I love the continuity of having a CV-22 
coming into the museum and landing on the field that once upon a time the biplanes were used to fly and they flew in and out of this field. So we have, as next year the National Museum prepares to celebrate its 100th anniversary, this is kind of a nice kickoff to fulfill that entire circle. So I thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your service and your help. And for those of us who worked on that diorama and the exhibit, this was a very emotional exhibit to work upon because many of us got to actually meet the participants. And if not, we knew other people who were forward air controllers. We knew other people who were on the ground. And so it had a personal connotation that I hope we did it justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. At this time, we're going to show a video of another very important individual in this entire scope who could not be with us today, and that is, at that time, Lieutenant Jim Fleming, who was the aircraft commander of this particular 20th SOS bird. And we lament that, that now Colonel Fleming, retired, is not able to be with us today, but we certainly remember and recognize him now. At this time, we're going to show a video of an interview of now retired Colonel Fleming speaking about his memories of that mission on that day. I was born in Sedalia, Missouri on the 12th of March, 1943. My father was, uh, he was a career pilot and uh, the driving force behind everything I did. I had great respect for him for a lot of reasons. And I always wanted to be a pilot in the Air Force. I, I never wanted to be anything else. That's why I went to, why do you go to college? I didn't want to work for a living. <laughs> so I went to college to be an ROTC and be a pilot, and I did. I became a pilot in the Air Force and was for 30 years. James Fleming graduated from Washington State University in 1966 and was commissioned a lieutenant in the Air Force. Halfway through pilot training, the Air Force needed helicopter pilots to go to Vietnam. Fleming's desire was to fly in combat, so he volunteered. By 1968, he was living in the jungle of Vietnam and flying special forces units deep into enemy territory for reconnaissance patrols. Before you took off, you would brief, you would go over, and you would shake hands and hug the team members and the crew members. Not a lot of talking going on. And what's going on here is what you see in, in football. When men stand around and hold hands, these big guys hold hands, there's a bonding going on there. Just, in fact, just the hair stems on my neck when I think about it. There's a bonding going on there. No talking, but what you're doing is you're saying, I'm gonna take you and I'm gonna put you out in the middle of hell. If you have to come home, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you home. I'm telling him that. That's my duty, it's my honor. That's what I do, That's I will do that for you. That's what I'm gonna do. And he is taken into his heart, I'm gonna go out there and do my job because you know what? I know if I get in trouble, Jim's gonna come and get me. Real hot area we were going into, all up and down the Cambodian border. When we went on a mission, we went in a formation of five helicopters, two gunships, the insert or exfil slick, the guy that puts them in or the guy that picks them up, an empty slick to pick up anyone that's shot down because we're behind enemy lines. No one's coming after us. No air support, no artillery support, no ground support. We're on our own. And of course, we had a forward air controller, either an 01 or an 02 that would lead us in. 
On November 26th, Fleming and his crew inserted a seven-man special forces team across the border into Cambodia for an intelligence gathering mission. After getting a team okay from the ground, they went to a remote location to wait. We're sitting around listening to rock and roll from Armed Forces Radio and eating sea rations and smoking cigars and, you know, setting alert out in the middle of this miserable little place. When I put the team in, they got their 20-minute okay. They moved up to this road and set up a watch position and an ambush position. They had been there a couple hours, and here came a large enemy force down this trail. And one of these enemy soldiers walks over and starts to relieve himself. The guy saw Frank's eyes. He looked forward and looked at him, and then all of a sudden he, he jerked back, and Frank hit him, and that opened up the ambush. All seven of these guys that were there opened up an ambush and knocked down who was ever in front of them, and then started leapfrogging back to get out of the area. And as soon as they did that, the radio operator with them keyed the mic, and said, Tango 5-1, contact, need extraction. As soon as that happens, we get it, we're on our way. Now they're after him. They chased him to this large river, which is the border between Cambodia and Vietnam. And they can't get across the river. So they're now, with their backs to the river, set up a defensive position, put Claymore mines out, that they had with them, and they're fighting off these people that are starting to come in on. The FAC has identified where he thinks they are, because they're moving. He's got a general idea of where they are. He knows they're on the river, but exactly where he can't really tell. And of course, the first guys to get there are the gunships. What do gunships like to do more than they like to do anything else? Rock and roll, full automatic. Well, lo and behold, they go across, and we didn't know these people were pulling some Chinese 51 caliber machine guns with them. They hit the first gunship. He starts trailing blue smoke, and he yells, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm going down. He turns back, goes across the river and crash lands. The empty slick spirals down. They get in that helicopter, and they go home. They can't help anybody, they got it, so they're going home. The third medic helicopter has engine trouble and goes home. The second gunship, Leonard Gonzalez, who gets the Air Force Cross this day, goes across the team and takes battle damage and starts trailing blue smoke. So while this is going on, the Ford Air Controller is talking to me and he's, he's saying, what are we gonna do? And I said, well, I'll tell you what. These guys down there have seen one helicopter crash, one of them leave trailing smoke, other helicopters leaving. I'm the only one here, get me, get me low, way out, throw me in there, I bet you I can sneak in there and get them. So I hit that riverbank, and my right door gunner uh, starts shooting. And we're starting to take damage, we're starting to take uh, uh, rounds, and all of a sudden the radio operator says, uh, get out, get out, they got us, get out. I hear that, we're taking damage, so I put the nose down, go down the river, leave the area, and as I leave the area, I pop up, go over, and I look over, there are people everywhere. The enemy is now focused in where they are. So the enemy is starting to go in. At that time, they blew their claymores, claymore mines, and knocked them back. So I see the claymores go off and the dust come up, and I tell the fact, bring me in one more time. I know where they are now, bring me in one more time. As I say that, Leonard Gonzalez says, you going back in, he says, I'm going to try it one more time. He says, he says, I'll tell you what, he says, follow me. He says, I'll, I'll go over it, I'll go over him one more time, I'll give him everything I got and I got to go home. He goes over him, over the smoke, and he rock and roll. This is urban legend, but in, in my urban legend, <laughs> the other crew members are shooting their pistols out the window, you know? <laughs> so they give him everything they got, and he says, see you at home, Jim, and he takes off. So I hit the riverbank again, and we're doing the same operation. And Fred Cook yells, go right, they have to be right, because that's where the bullets are coming from. <laughs> and as we get further down, we're starting to take some pretty good damage, and Fred is shooting and yelling, and go right, go right, stop, stop. I got him. They had made it down to the riverbank, 
and they were half in the water, half of them in the reeds, this sort of underbrush, and the blades had blown those reeds, and we found them. And Fred Cook, God bless him, I hear him go, hold your hover, hold your hover. I got one, and what he's doing is he's leaning down and grabbing these guys and jerking them in. And I'm looking around and I see people darting up and you know, just sort of jumping up and down, up and down and shooting and, and he's shooting. And... There are seven of them out there. We only got six. And as I look over, Randy Harrison jumps up. He was the last man and he waited till everybody was aboard. He gave him a last burst of his automatic weapon, threw it down and took off to the helicopter and, and jumped in the water, sort of a fly and jump in the water trying to hit the helicopter, missed, and uh, took about one stroke in the water and got his arm over the skid. And Fred Cook reaches down and grabs him by the rucksack and yells, let's go. And we drug him through the water and off we went. Uh, and went back and, and uh, the rest is history. I was injured in January 1969 and medevaced to Japan. And I spent from January, February, March in the hospital in Tachikawa Hospital in Japan. And when I got back to Vietnam, one of our helicopters showed up, picked me up, was going to take me back to the unit. So I get on the helicopter, and of course, you know how guys are. How was it, Jim? Did you have a good time? Oh, yeah, I had a good time. You know, that sort of stuff. And the guy flying was uh, uh, George Livingston. He said, well, Jim you're going home. I said, yeah, I got another three or four months of this left. And he said, no. He says, you're going home tomorrow. I said, I'm going home tomorrow. Why? He says, the president's nominated you for the Medal of Honor. It was by Richard Nixon in the White House in May of 1970. They flew us in, my family and I, and, and uh, my mother and father were flown in, and my father had his uniform on. I doubt if I'd seen him in a uniform in the entire time I ever lived at home. He always wore a flight suit. He was a crew dog. He flew airplanes. That's what he did. But he had a uniform on, and I looked down at his ribbons, and he had an air medal. And I, I said, Dad, where, where'd you get the air medal? <laughs> he looks at me, and he goes, Iwo Jima. I said, Iwo Jima? He said, yeah. I said, what? What'd you do at Iwo Jima? He says, I was the pilot of the C-47, one of them, that went down that beach dropping gun barrels and blood plasma to the Marines. And then the band, the band, had a band, does the Hail to the Chief. And it was like the, 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 the waters had parted in what President Nixon. It was just great. He says, I tell you, he says, I'm just so proud to be an American today and so proud to be able to bestow on these Americans the highest honor I can possibly bestow on them. Today's not my day, it's your day. You know, how many helicopter pilots were in Vietnam? Thousands. How many helicopter pilots did what I did and got shot down and died? No one saw it. Hundreds? I know that. I was recognized, and I, 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 owe, I owe a lot to those that weren't. I tried to, sometimes I haven't been quite as good as I should have been, uh, but uh, I think I've held it up pretty well. In watching that video, I think everyone can understand the caliber of men that these units produced. And Jim is certainly reflective of that. And he's reflective of all the men of the 20th that served in Southeast Asia. That without any hesitancy, without any thinking about it, they were willing to lay down their life for one another. I think that's an absolutely amazing thing. And Jim is reflective of so many of you in this audience tonight. We invite back to the podium again, as Jim mentioned in the video, on the right door gun at that, 
at that moment in time on the 26th of November 1968 was Staff Sergeant Fred Cook. At this time, we invite Fred to share a few words with us. I really don't know if I can do this or not, honestly. Because when I was asked if only to speak, of course I do. Friends here I've not seen in 48 years. And a lot of thanks I want to give. When I started looking at what I was going to do, a country song came to mind, Digging Up Bones. And that's what I did a lot of, digging up bones, trying to remember the people I flew with and worked with and what people meant to me. And so many of them are here today. But I, I, I really want to use this time just to say thank you. That's all. Thank you to the staff here at the museum. They did an awesome job. I, don't, I know I first started talking to them in either 2010, 2011, something like that. So this has been building that long. But they worked so hard to make sure it was right, it was accurate. I don't know how many phone calls I got. Was it this way or that way? So thank, I thank the staff. Everyone's involved. And I remember Scott Bradley very well. And then to put this together, Alex, and I don't think we've recognized Alex, but he is, give him a round, please. Yeah. Something like this doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of work. And then Jim Burns is the other one that put hours and hours and hours into this. So thank you, Jim. And I borrowed some of Jim's homework, got some names, some people I want to say thank you to. Some have passed on, but I still want someone to be recognized. I cannot find the names of all the crew members on that mission. But sort of been mentioned, Colonel Fleming, our co-pilot was uh, Major McClellan, he has passed on. Then myself and JJ. And then down the list, I have Major Eppinger, Major Heyman, Brodier, Miller, Winkles, Gonzalez, Russell, Combs, Cogan, Miller, Simonetti, Reynolds, Leroy, Milton. Notice that was Leroy. I got straight now. It's not Leroy. It's Leroy. <laughs> the best drum player you have ever heard. I promise you. And how did that get in this conversation? We got some little old band to come up to Bama Tua City to entertain us. And they had a drummer that could high play the drums. And Leroy said, if you let me up there, I'll show you how to play the drums. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're who we are, <laughs> get him up there. And Leroy broke the drum head. He played it that hard. So we had to take up a collection and buy a new drum head for that drummer. But yes, and then to the team itself, Franks, as mentioned, and Hughes and Harrison, uh, the facts, H Huber and Anderson. And Franks, the team leader, he was known as Dry Hole Franks. He never run into anything, nothing at all. We put him in, he stayed the time he's supposed to stay, we'd go get him. No firefights, no action, no adrenaline rush. But when he stirred it up, he stirred it up big time. And many times, the people that get overlooked on a display like this or recognition like this is a maintenance guy. You know, someone's got to keep those helicopters, or in this case, the uh, Osprey, yeah. Osprey flying. And I know we had an engine man at Bama Tui, and I don't even remember his name, but he made sure that our engines put out 100%. There's people like that that don't get recognized that I want to say thank you to. The gun plumbers that kept the guns working fine. Everyone did their job and did it well, just like Jim was talking, the facts and the gun birds and the slicks and the team that's on the ground. Everyone did their job well, so the mission went off like it did, but it would not have been there were it not for the ground troops, the ground people. Not only did that mission go exciting that day, that was, I almost hate to say, our norm. But the day before that, we had one just as hot, right, JJ? The day after that, one of our birds was shot down. We lost a member of the 20th. So that's the kind of missions that we flew. Again, thank you to the ground people that kept those helicopters going. 
thank you for the support. And really, I want to say thank you to the wives and families of back home. That kept me going. So thank y'all, yes, please. And a friend closer than a brother, Randy Harrison, the team leader, one I had to literally jink. I, I, don't, I don't know if he's just gonna stay there and play with him or try to see how many he could shoot or what, but he was slow getting in the helicopter. Now looking, okay, we're getting shot at. We got six men on board. One's holding us up. If we can get him in, we can leave and we don't get shot at. You don't have to figure, but we'll get in the helicopter and he weren't fast enough, so I had to help him. That's how that came about. So he goes in and stirs stuff up. That's him. Yeah, he stirs stuff up, then wants us to come get him because he didn't want to walk out. That, that's my friend, Randy. But I would like to say thank you to the crew from Canon. That's some also awesome piece of equipment you're flying. And I want to say thank you for being here in the 20th on. I enjoyed my time in the 20th. If I was 17, I'd do it again, because, uh, but I'm older and wiser now, so I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> but uh, thank you all so much, and just continue to carry it on. And I notice, and where is she? Where's the pilot? Stand up, please. Please. We didn't have one of those when I was in the 20th. <laughs> you keep doing everything you're capable of doing and don't let anybody talk you out of it, okay? Carry on the tradition of the 20th. If you give you a hard time, call me. I'm sure we can round up two or three guys to help you out, okay? <laughs> But thank you all for this. Thank you all for being here. And again, thank the staff for making this possible. I appreciate each one of you. I love you. You'll never know how much. And thank you. Thank you, Fred. For those of you who have served in units like this, current day, past, present, you know the bond. You know how unique and significant that bond is. And that bond existed on that day, on that helo, in that squadron, as it did with so many other units in Southeast Asia. And I see the bond between Fred and JJ and Jim and Paul. And at that point, it's not lieutenant to staff sergeant, it's comrade to comrade, and they're working together, watching each other to, to take care of other comrades on the ground. They're, they're comrades in a very bad way, in a very bad situation. The reconnaissance team there on that riverbank, and we see that, we see that living history today that you gentlemen show us and that you, you reflect that to us in a very personal way. I find that extremely special and, and it's just an, an amazing, amazing thing to be with you and to listen to those things today. Fred and JJ are with us today. They were on that bird and today we're honored to have one individual on the reconnaissance team that Fred mentioned there in his comments. This was the team one, two. A reconnaissance team typically is made up of between six to eight or nine individuals. Generally, it encompasses at least three Americans. The team leader is given the term the one zero. The, the second man is the one one, and the third man is the one two. On that day, the 26th of November, 1968, the one two was in fact a strap hanger. And that's the term for an individual that is not organic to the team, but is joining that mission for whatever reason. And on that day, First Lieutenant Randy Harrison was a strap hanger and he was joining the team to understand what his men were experiencing. Technically, he didn't have to run missions as an officer and especially as the company commander, but Randy Harrison specifically chose to make the decision, I want to understand what my men are experiencing. 
So at this time, we invite Randy Harrison to share a few words with us. Please welcome Randy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an amazing place. And if you will allow me to, I'd like to begin with the digression. Uh, when I first heard of this event, I wondered how it would be that somebody who wore army green was going to be given a day pass into the Sanctum Sanctorium of Air Force Blue. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe somebody told him about my mom and dad. My father, Robert Burfoot Harrison, in the summer of 1939, quit his job as a department store and enlisted in the United States Army Air Corps. His first assignment was with the 93rd Bomb Group, uh, flying out of Langley Field and flying, with all due respect to these wonderful airplanes, I just saw one yesterday for the first time, a Douglas B-18. And he was the radio operator flying coastal patrol missions. Thirty years later, he retired as a command pilot with thousands and thousands of hours. And there were two things that Dad told me about his time in Air Force Blue. He told me these repeatedly. The first was that there is no more honorable a profession in the world than defending a democracy. The second was he couldn't believe people got paid like him for flying an airplane. <laughs> when I told my, my mom and dad that I had quit uh, college in my junior year and enlisted in the Army, volunteered for infantry and volunteered for Vietnam, uh, they were not amused. My father couldn't believe it. He actually took me out to a couple of Air Force bases and said, look, you could be doing this. Now that my parents have attained cruise altitude and are flying in the same close formation that they flew for 60 years, I just can't help but look up and say, look at this place, Mom. Didn't I tell you things would be OK? And they have turned out really well. For thousands of years, when warriors gather, particularly young warriors, they talk about their shared experience in combat. Who did what? Who said what? Why did they do that? And nothing is more valued than the praise of their brothers in arms. But as warriors age, as we get older, while we never forget, in fact, we build our memories, in fact, we may even build our lives on the memories of those days, or maybe in this case, that day, our perspective widens and deepens and we begin to focus more and more on what we have done with the time that we have been given. And for most of us, that focus on what we have done and what we will leave behind takes the form of our family and specifically of our children. 4,000 years ago, the Greek poet laureate Homer wrote his epic Odyssey and Iliad the Odyssey tells of the return of King uh, Odysseus, whom the Romans called Ulysses, to his home after almost 20 years of absence. About 170 years ago, the English poet laureate Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote his version of that story. And in it, there is a section where Ulysses introduces his fellow mariners, his brothers in arms, to his only son, who he hasn't seen for 20 years, who held the fort while Ulysses was in front of the walls of Troy. And Tennyson has Ulysses say this. This is my son, my own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor and by slow prudence to make mild or rugged people, through soft degrees subduing them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duty, 
decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and to pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. And when I read those words frequently, and I recommend them to those of you who haven't seen it, read Ulysses. If you're a warrior, if you want to have an understanding of a warrior's life, if you're not one, look it up and read it. And when I read it, I find myself saying, these are my sons, my own Tyler Randolph and my own Robert Spencer, to whom I will leave what I may. I love my sons. They are caring. They are good citizens. They are the vessels in which I have placed our family traditions and our values. And they will carry them into the future. They live their lives, and I have lived mine. There was, there was a specific moment on the 26th of November of 1968 when I had to leave my position on the line to refill my magazines, about 20 of them, as a matter of fact, that were empty. And I moved to my rucksack, and as I was loading my magazines, I looked across the river at the increasing amount of trucer weapons fire that was coming into our position. And there were three things that I knew. One was that Jim and JJ and Paul and Fred had already come in once and we couldn't get to them, and they left. Two was that three of the five helicopters supporting us were out of the picture. And the third thing was that I knew with as much certainty as I've known before or since that I was going to die that day in that place. There was no question about it. It was a shoulder shrug kind of thing. It's over, right here. And I thought of my mother. There is an ancient American spiritual. The words to which, I'm sorry. All right, I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming forward to carry me home. It was a band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, swing low, coming for to carry me home. It would be incredibly presumptuous of me to assume that twice in my life, a band of angels and a sweet chariot will swing low to carry me home. But I'll tell you what, if it happens again, I'm gonna know it before I see it because I've heard the sound of angels' wings before. They sound like a UH-1 10 feet off the deck coming in at full speed. <laughs> to carry me home, home to a completed college education, home to great work, home to wonderful friends, home to marriage, and home to children, two sons, that I would never have known were it not for the Green Hornets on that day in that terrible, terrible place. So Fred, JJ, Jim, Paul, wherever you are, man, I will never be able to adequately express to you my love and my appreciation for giving me the opportunity to dance at my son's wedding. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> if what Randy just described to us and what Fred and what all of you men represent in your service, if that is not, if that is not the epitome of brotherhood, then I do not know what is. So all of you are tremendous, not only tremendous warriors, but brothers to the very end. Thank you.
Lastly, we invite, finally, the director of the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Please welcome Lieutenant General Retired Jack Hudson. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to do three things here today. And so the first one is to uh, ask uh, all of you to let's keep in our thoughts and prayers all of our folks, uh, military and civilian, who are deployed around the world, many of whom are in harm's way, and their families who anxiously await their safe return. We have many of them out there. Uh, we know some of what we're doing. Some we don't know about, but they're out there and they're doing a great job, mostly young folks. So let's keep all them and their families in our thoughts and prayers. Secondly, I would just like to um, say that we're in the uh, middle of a multi-year commemoration and, and remembrance and thank you for all of our veterans of Southeast Asia. So uh, would all of you who are served in Southeast Asia please raise your hands and let us recognize you. We got a lot of hands out there. Thank you for your service. And thirdly, I want to tell, um, tell you all just a little bit about what all this means for our Air Force and our nation and our National Museum of the United States Air Force. So our mission here is twofold. One is to tell the Air Force story to the public and secondly, to inspire our youth. So everything you see here does uh, one of those two components or both. So it takes time and effort and a lot of research and a lot of help and resources to make things happen here. Um, it just does. And we work very hard at that and we need help for that and by gosh, uh, we've done it. So for example, the Green Hornet exhibit here, which, which we are honoring today, uh, was uh, a long time in the making, but it's all worthwhile. And we do our very best to make sure that things are authentic, that they're real, that they're accurate. And so uh, earlier this afternoon, just before the ceremony, I was standing with our uh, mission veterans, and uh, Randy asked me, well, what else can we do for you? And I said, you know, you, you folks have already done it. You're here, you served, you helped, us, you helped us make sure that we got things right. For example, when we first did the exhibit, uh, we didn't have the right pistol holster. And um, we found that out uh, thanks to Randy. And so we thought, okay, we got to get this right because we want everything right. So we fixed that. And so we work very hard to make sure everything is accurate, authentic, and just right. And really the question for you folks from me is what else can we do for you? So uh, we're there for you. You just let us know. And so what a great um, component this is for all that we do to tell that Air Force story to the public and inspire our kids. And folks, we're here for the long haul. Not just for today, but forever from now. Uh, that's part of our Southeast Asia gallery and a great part of it. So uh, here we are. So today is also exciting because we have today's version here today in the form of the CV-22 and crew from the 20th and the wing at Cannon. And so we're just extremely honored that they are all here with us today. And for all of you here who are currently serving, thanks for your service. We appreciate very much all that you do for us. And so I was out there this morning and saw the air airplane come in and land and of course the media are out there and doing their interviews and so uh, the operations officer was being interviewed and there was a question that I believe had to do with well, what's different now compared to 48 years ago and I thought his answer was spot on. He said, well, the technology is much different but the mission's the same. And I thought that's a great way to capture that. I, also, I would also add to that that the character of the people is the same. Because you know, we all know that if a similar scenario happened as described over here in the exhibit today in a jungle somewhere that our 20th folks would do exactly the same thing that the crew did back then to get our folks and pull them out. And we also know that that has happened many times uh, 
plots that we don't know about or doesn't get publicized, but has happened and will continue to happen in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places around the world where our folks are operating. So the character has not changed either. Our folks, and you know it when you talk to them, that that's the same too, that they would do exactly the same things today. They do it now and will continue to do that uh, moving forward. And all of our folks are like that. So that part is just the same as well, that splendid character that we have to have and we do have in our military. So the other thing I'll add here is that uh, we have a CV-22 over on the other part of the base here. It's in a restoration hangar. So later this year, uh, when we um, uh, disassemble and take away the Math Alive exhibit, and it goes on to its next stop, and that area is freed up, and we do a little bit of moving around back there, the CV-22 will come over. And so uh, that was the test airplane that came here from Hurlbert. And so we have it now as a representative of that mission, of that uh, airplane, and of the people who fly it, maintain it, support it. It'll be there in the Cold War gallery. So we're really fortunate in that we have the thread. We have the thread from the 20th here with the Green Hornet exhibit connected to the CV-22 later this fall over there in the Cold War gallery. And what a great thing that is. I mean, we are so fortunate that we can do those kind of things to help tell the Air Force story and inspire our kids. You could see all that out there today uh, with the airplane and the big crowd that was out there and everybody that came through. Uh, we'll see it day after today, day after day as visitors come through the museum, come through the museum and see these exhibits and uh, read about the stories of the people who were, inv who were involved. We'll see it in the form of the education programs that tell the stories of the Air Force to uh, all who come here, particularly the school groups. And we see lots of them for in every bus that shows up here with a load of kids that comes through here. We know there are future airmen or civil servants in the form of scientists or engineers in those buses. And they are inspired by what, that, by what they see and learn here. And so all of the exhibits here, all the stories they read about, everything they see goes toward that inspiration. And now we have it with the Green Hornet exhibit here. We'll have it with the CV-22 back here, and we'll fill that out with photographs, text, and other things to help tell the CV-22 stories as well. So again, thanks to all who served in uh, Southeast Asia. We are deeply honored to have our mission vets here today. Uh, thank you for your service. We are just extremely glad you're here. And once again, what else can we do for you? You let us know. For those who are currently serving, thanks for your service. Thanks for being here today. We look forward to seeing your flyover, uh, flyovers on Saturday morning. We just need a little bit better in the form of the weather forecast, but hopefully we'll be there for that. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Thank you, General Hudson. At this time, Jim Burns will approach the stage and he would like to make a special, special presentation to General Hudson at this time. First of all, I want to say thank you to the museum staff and the folks and Jane Leach, who've really been tremendous, and to Alex, who's been my contact here locally and really arranged everything. Uh, on behalf of all the Green Hornets uh, and furnished by the active duty folks, uh, Colonel Bergen, would you please come up? They have uh, commissioned a uh, lithograph by Ron Wong called Once a Hornet, Always a Hornet. And it shows the legacy of the Green Hornets and uh, we have a presentation I'd like to give to General Hudson and to the museum, and it shows all of our leg legacy for all of the Green Hornets. General Hudson. This represents all of the aircraft that the Green Hornets have flown and are flying. Thank you. 
And I want to thank Colonel Bergen and, and Colonel Mutza about the, uh, for furnishing the lithograph and allowing us to present this to the museum. And thank you all for attending. It's been great. Thank you. What, uh, I don't know if most of you can see the lithograph, it's just beautiful because it shows the lineage of the 20th from the first aircraft to the current CB-22. So what a fantastic representation of the history of such a distinctive and proud and combat rich unit as the 20th. This day, folks, did not occur by accident. It did not occur easily. And a lot of that is owed to this facility that we are in currently. So many people in the National Museum of the United States Air Force work so hard from the beginning of the creation, the development, and the actual building of this exhibit to bring us here today. So at this time, for those museum staff who had a hand in this event and in that exhibit, please raise your hand so that we could certainly recognize all the wonderful work you have done. Amazing, amazing work. Uh, I know talking with Scott and Roberta and Teresa, and those are just a few names, just an amazing team, folks, that build and strive to preserve the history, the history that you men made in Southeast Asia and that we strive, as the general said, to display to our children and future generations that will live us far into the future. Keep that history alive. I will recognize, uh, rec recognize that after the event, we'll have a quick photo ceremony. If you'd like to take photos with the veterans or others, please feel free to do so. And at this time, I pay final homage, and we pay final homage to you, all of you men, the men of the 20th and MACV SOG and the facts. We stand, we stand on your shoulders. We we preserve the history and the heritage and the actions and the valor that you displayed each and every day in your service. We are better Americans and we are a better nation for all of your service. So we stand in tremendous debt to all of you. <laughs> On behalf of the National Museum of the United States Air Force, we thank you for attending today. We ask that you drive home safely. And if everyone could please stand for the playing of the Air Force song by the Wright-Patterson Band of Flight. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.